and we'll go ahead and get started. And we, we will be monitoring the chat box as well. So as we go through this, if you do have some questions, um, definitely put them in the chat box because we want to make sure that for those of you that are taking your time out this evening, that we are uh, answering your questions at the, and that you're getting the most amount of, amount of value, uh, again, from taking the time from being with us this evening. So appreciate you guys jumping on and uh, we'll start here. Uh, we'll give it two more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just a quick introduction though. Uh, my name is Russell Fawcett. I'm the Director of Operations on the CERN team. And tonight joining me, I have Jeremy Par Martin, who is our lead listening agent. So again, we'll give it just a couple more minutes. We'll introduce ourselves, go into a little bit more about our background, um, and then we'll we'll get running. All right, so I want to respect everyone's time that's already uh, jumped on here. So we're going to go ahead and, and jump on. And again, if you want to use the chat box to ask us a specific question, definitely feel free to do so. Um, so let's go ahead, go ahead and jump on. So again, tonight, we're going to be talking about how to increase the value of your home, uh, talking about different things that, that you can do you know, one, to increase the marketability of your home if you're getting ready to sell, or also talk about things that, that you should be doing, you know, during your home ownership to help preserve the value of your home. Um, so it, again, as I said before, my name is Russell Fawcett. I'm the director of operations here on the Stern team. Also, you know, with Jeremy Martin, um, our lead listing agent. Um, and then we also together have a general, we own a general contracting company um, where we've, you know, worked for people, but also flipped some homes personally. And so we want to go through again and, and talk about some of those strategies that we use when evaluating what we should do with, with one of the homes that we're going to put on the market. And then, you know, I'll go ahead and Jeremy, go ahead and, you know, tell a little bit about your background. I mean, kind of what you do with the Stern team and, and, and give us an introduction of you as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so as the lead listing specialist on the team, my primary job that I do day in and day out is work with sellers who are getting ready to put their home on the market um, at a given time to, you know, sell for whatever reason in, you know, that is necessary for them um, in that process. You know, I, my job is to maximize their profits and make the process as easy for them as possible. Um, you know, help them get their home ready, looking good, um, sharp, you know, to where buyers instantly fall in love with it. Uh, like I tell my clients all the time, you only get one chance to make a first good impression to any given buyer. And this is where we create that wow factor. So I go through homes with my clients room by room, help them stage prep and talk about condition updates, features, you know, these sorts of things that will maximize, you know, not just their profits, their bottom line, but also just make a smoother sell for them, right? Because a, a happy buyer is a humble buyer. You know, they tend to be a lot less nitpicky 
and, and asking um, for things if they feel that the home has been well taken care of um, and, uh, you know, that they're going to love it just as much as the previous seller. Um, and then also, like Russell said, you know, we are general contractors, so we do work for a lot of other people, you know, on, you know, remodels or finishing basements, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and we flip, you know, quite a few homes as well. Um, we have a few projects of our own going. Um, so, um, you know, I manage that part of it as well in working with my contractors um, as we acquire and take care of these properties. Okay, sounds good. So let's go ahead and jump into it in kind of the way we're we've got this set up tonight is we're going to talk about um again kind of starting with some of the most basic things that you can do um and then move into some of the more in-depth you know so taking it from you know starting out to just cleaning the home to a full you know talking about a full remodel so let's go ahead as far as let's start it off jeremy so the first one that i have here you know to increase your value is to deep clean and declutter Help me understand why, I mean, why is that important? Well, it, it's, it's, it's quite simple. When you're working with a buyer, I mean, they make that first decision with emotions first, right? It, and then they justify it with logic later, meaning that when they walk into a home and it, it appears well-kept, well taken care of, right? Then, then they don't necessarily, in a sense, turn up their nose. Like if your home seems to be dirty and un, untaken care of, then they're going to start nitpicking and looking for other reasons why that home isn't worth what's being asked for. So you, you never want them to feel like it hasn't been loved and taken care of because you don't know who the buyer is going to be, whether they, you know, as clean or cleaner than you or not. So, so it, it's that first impression, right? Um, that, that they know that if you're, if you're detailed enough to make sure the home's you know, in good, clean order that you've also maintained it properly as well. So they don't have to worry about when's the last time that you service the furnace or, you know, um, do you blow out your sprinklers every year, take care of your AC system, you know, all those, all those functions of the house. Right. Well, and another thing, I mean, this is especially with the cleaning, right? So this is just one of those things that, that can help preserve the life of, of your house, um, you know, kind of just general maintenance on it. Right. And so it, if we don't clean on a regular basis, if we don't keep our homes maintained, then all of a sudden when we're going to sell, you know, we're, we're starting to look at having to replace the carpet, replace, you know, different things versus just being able to go through and, and maybe shampoo, you know, do some of those deep cleaning items and cleaning a home. Actually, it's crazy, but you know, you can, this is one of those things that you can use elbow grease. Um, I always, you know, when I'm working with clients, I always tell them that, you know, the magic eraser is your best friend because it's amazing, honestly, what that thing can do. There's, you know, sometimes scuffs on the wall that really look like, oh, shoot, I'm going to have to paint this wall when really the magic eraser and a little bit of el elbow grease and that that comes off. So it's one of those things that you may even be able to save having to paint or replace a carpet if you just give it a good clean. Um, the other thing on here is declutter. So again, so this is, this is one of the, the homes that we worked with. And again, we did some updating to the, to the kitchen that we'll talk about, but you can even see just in that layout, you know, if we're, we're cleaning off the counters, we're decluttering. I mean, what's some of the, the advice when you go into, you know, a listing appointment, what's some of that staging advice or how can they essentially take what they already have? So not even really looking at investing any money into it but what are some things that that you advise them to do to make sure that their home presents well to a potential buyer well and, and then what i tell them is put yourself in the shoes of the buyer most buyers are in that move up stage right so a lot of times they're going from one home to the next home which typically is bigger and the last thing you want a buyer to do is walk into your home and think, oh, no, this is too small for me. My table won't fit. My stuff won't fit. I don't have enough counter space or cabinet space simply because, you know, you've got too much stuff, right? I mean, you, how can somebody, if you have a buyer that loves to cook, you know, and wants a spacious kitchen and counter because the kitchen is a focal point of a home, but then they're, they're cluttered up with items all over the counter. And even if it's more clean than your photo, and it's simply a lot of utensils and toasters and blenders and things like that, I have my clients remove all that stuff. What they don't need in a seven to 10 day period needs to be packed and put away, right? As we're pre getting ready for the sale. But if it's something that they 
they need on a regular basis, like a coffee maker or utensils, you know, if they're, if that stuff as they're cleaning out the cupboards, um, you know, will fit in a drawer or something like that, rather than on the counter, that's where we put it. Because again, we only have so much space to work with and we need every inch of that space to feel as big as possible. Because the reality is we have no idea what buyer is going to walk in that door and how important this kitchen is to them. A kitchen is important to the majority of buyers, but how important is it to this specific buyer? Right. And we don't want to ever narrow our, our buyer pool just because we let something feel cluttered and small. Same thing again, move up, you know, um, somebody moving into your home, they may have, you know, I, I've heard it from clients a lot, like my table just will not fit in here. So we would have them stage and set and prep that table in the kitchen for place settings. Right. Because in a two dimensional world, it is really hard to see depth. Um, and which is where most people look at homes to begin with in a two-dimensional online. Um, so we, we create a little bit of depth with some of the staging tips that we do. Um, same thing with that garbage can in the middle of the kitchen, right? Well, then they start looking at it. Well, I don't want my garbage can in the middle of the kitchen. So where am I going to put that? This house is clearly too small because they'd have that somewhere other than that, right? Um, so we want to declutter de-junk. If there are stuff that you don't need again in that seven to 10 day period, let's pack it up, put it away. If you do need it, let's find a better place for it. Right. And there's a lot of stuff, right? So I've even seen things where, where people recommend as we start to get ready to sell the home, right? I mean, label a couple boxes. This is, you know, this is garbage. This is donate. And this is, this is keep start packing it up. You're going to move anyways. Right. And we want to make sure that we're getting we want everything to look bigger. We want the closets, you know, as far as if it's winter time, put away the summer clothes. If it's summertime, put away the winter clothes and let's open up those closets. Cause again, one of the things that's really important to buyers is making sure that your home does feel, you know, spacious inside. Well, and not only that, but even flow, like, I mean, if you had that one person that did not want the entry, like this side door where those jackets are hanging to come off into their kitchen, right? And, and maybe this home doesn't really flow that way, but from this picture, it appears that way because the jackets are there, um, you know, and they'll decide that they don't want to come see your home just because of the way it appears and it presents itself there. But really that could flow into another part of the home that they would have been perfectly acceptable with other than they would have never seen it in person to know that. Same thing, like, I mean, so if you spend the time and money to update and remodel your home. Look at the beautiful flooring in this house and the cabinetry and the appliances. And when the picture is so full of stuff, and the rugs and the tables and the chairs, you can't see that flooring. So it is impossible for a buyer to emotionally connect themselves with this house because they don't know how pretty it is. They don't know how beautiful these finishes are because your stuff is in the way. Right. And another thing that we do to, to actually declutter a little bit, which, um, Tell me, I mean, tell me kind of some of your thoughts behind that is actually window blinds, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes depending on the condition of those blinds, we'll actually take them out completely. And sometimes we even leave them there for the future buyer, right? So if they want to put them back up, um, but help me understand, I mean, what's the reasoning behind taking out a window blind or pulling down a curtain and like we did in this one? Um, well, for one, like you said, if they're faded and they're sun bleached, things like that, nobody wants to look at that. It's not, it's not nice to look at. But secondly, the more natural light that you can put into a space makes it feel bigger and more open. It never feels dark. Nobody wants to live in a dungeon. So the more natural light you can bring in, the better it's going to feel, the more welcoming, inviting that it's going to feel to a, to a person. Okay. Sounds good. Let's go on to the next one. So the next one, again, these first couple aren't really things that you know, most people would say we're improving the value of our home, right? But these are things that come up with buyers. And so our next one is rep repairs and deferred maintenance. I mean, talk to me about that. What, what do you do when you're walking through a home, you know, like this one right here, right? The, the kitchen sink's completely functional. Why can't I leave that? <laughs> yeah, because remember, you want you want to maximize your profits, right? You want as much out of this house as you can. And a buyer walks into this house, and even if you've priced your home for certain conditions and features and say, this is market value, they always look at this house and they say, okay, 
this is what the home's worth now minus this is how much money I'm going to have to put into the home to make it mine to where I'm happy to, you know, to live with this. So they automatically start hitting your bottom line, deducting from your net just by all these given repairs. And, and, and to be honest with you, if they see enough of this stuff that is just deferred maintenance that simply could have been taken care of and relatively inexpensive, you may completely turn them away from the house altogether. You may literally lose a buyer who would have loved your home, but really they just never connected with it. Because again, they make that decision with emotions and, and, and there's plenty of buyers out there who are not handy, right? So this kind of thing could overwhelm them, right? They don't know a good plumber, especially in the first time buyer category. They've never had to deal with these things before. Um, so, you know, they're coming from the rental world where they didn't have to deal with any of this. So it is very scary and overwhelming to look at all these repairs that need to be made and think, oh my goodness, like not only can I not afford this because most buyers buy at the top of their budget anyway, um, they don't know who or how to fix it. Well, and I, th I think it's funny. So I've toured a lot of homes and, and I don't know if you've had this experience as well, um, but where just getting into the home is a project for some reason, obviously, you know, you're going in and out of your front door a lot. So sometimes it may be is something as simple as moving that strike shield, you know, maybe a quarter inch or something. So the door closes or tightening one of the screws on the doorknob. So the, the doorknob actually functions properly. Right. But if it's a struggle to actually open the door right off the bat, it's like, what else is going to go wrong with this house? Like already I've got, you know, the doorknob just fell off in my hand. What do I do? Right. And so, you know, just going through it. And, and that's one of the things, you know, as we look at is we just go through the home and uh, make sure that if you know it's broken, it's going to need repaired because the buyer more than likely is going to ask for it, you know, the deferred maintenance items. And again, these are things that over, over time actually do affect the value of your home. And depending on what it is, if it's, you know, maybe it's a small leak where you're like, ah, I can just wrap a towel around it. I stay on top of it. If you leave things like that for a long time, they could actually end up becoming bigger issues that cost more money in the long run. So, well, not only that, those become health and safety concerns, right? Right. So, and that's what it is. If a buyer sees enough of these things that are deferred maintenance, not only, you know, does your bottom line start being affected by it, but at the same time, then they look for reasons. They don't do it on purpose, but they look for reasons. People naturally gravitate towards some of the, it's easier to focus the energy around the negativity of something like this is far greater than the joy and excitement of it. So they look for it, right? Even if you have a beautiful house, um, people are always suspicious, like what's behind the walls? What did you do? Right. They're always wondering, did it get done right? That sort of thing. So even in a beautiful environment, they're still suspicious often as it is. So when you take something like this, you know, that, that it's deferred maintenance, then they really start to nitpick you. And, and then the wholesale is they're less humble. They're less willing to work with you. Um, if challenges come up, then, then, then they don't want to work with you or you may lose them altogether. Right. And what's crazy, so these first two items that we talked about, right? So a lot of the questions we get asked about is what has the highest return? And even those, maybe these don't, you know, aren't going to increase the value of your home the most. These are actually items that, that do have a high return on your investment because now all of a sudden it's like, if I have a broken faucet like this and maybe a loose doorknob and a hole in the drywall, whatever, all of a sudden, those guys, they don't just discount by the $100 what that faucet would cost. All of a sudden, they're making their offer, you know, five dollars or $10,000 below market value because of some broken items and some deferred maintenance. Again, well, sure, Russ. If I was going to spend your money to repair my house, believe me, I'm hiring contractors. But if I'm going to have to fix it myself, I'm doing it myself, right? So, so the cost automatically goes up because why, why would I fix it? I'm going to hire somebody to do it because you're paying for it. Right. But the reality is, is we talk about some of these other items, right, that are actually now starting to get more upgrading the home. Sometimes we can go spend a couple thousand dollars and yes, we'll raise, you know, maybe raise the purchase price of the home by a thousand dollars. It may be a break even, but I can tell you that someone's going to, just because you have a broken faucet like that, more than likely, unless they're handy, they're probably going to deduct, you know, a thousand dollars off their offer right away. So we're actually like even dollar amount, these little items actually have a higher return than if you were to go in and say remodel a whole bathroom, you know, again, depending on the condition of your current bathroom. 
So let's go ahead on, on to the next one. The next one's another, you know, thing that, that most people can, can do is DIY yourself, you know, painting a home. And, and so again, we have just kind of a before and after it. And the, you know, obviously they, they went a little bit further and actually painted the rails as well in this, this picture. Um, but paint is definitely one of those things that immediately, uh, there, there's two aspects of painting. One, first it changes visually, obviously, um, you know, to something that, that is very appealing. But it's, again, it's kind of like a new car, right? You have a new car smell. That paint gives the home that new home smell that appeals to not only now the visual sense, but also, you know, to being able to smell like, oh, this home is newer because there's a coat of paint on the wall. And so, I mean, talk to me as far as, you know, how do you choose your paint colors? And then how do you know when you should paint a wall versus leaving it alone? So, so paint, one of the, one of the things is, is it's, it's crazy, right? Um, paint is very fickle as far as it will make a home feel dated, right? I mean, you can look the same house, painted the railing, painted some of these things, same house, very little changes, but it does look like a more modern updated home because paint is one of those things that is very trendy, right? The fall walls, the accent walls, those things, everybody knows somebody that probably still has an accent wall or had one just a few years ago, but 10, 15 years ago, every house had an accent wall. So they're very date, you know, trendy that way. And they will make a home feel dated. Um, you know, one thing a paint does is, is it can darken or lighten a room, right? Um, and make it feel more dungeony. Um, you know, it does, and, and it is a very easy way to make a home feel very crisp as well too. So you can see the fine details and, you know, the things that make it look really Really good. It, it's one of the most affordable things that everybody could do. But this here's what I always tell my clients is you could paint this house, your given buyer's favorite color. And if you caught them on the wrong day, they would completely turn away from your home. It's a very personal decision. It's a design decision. So when you paint, the idea is as neutral and as modern with those times as possible. And the best way for you to be able to do, you know, to be, because some people are, they just, they're not interior designers, right? Picking paint color is just stresses them out. So my recommendation is, is visit four or five model homes, go look at the models, see what everybody's doing. Because Russell, when you and I started flipping homes, three-tone paint was the rave, right? Gray walls, white trim, everything. And over the last several months, we've completely converted to all white simply because that's what everybody wants. That's what all of the new construction are doing. Well, but if you, if you, if you go back in time, single tone, all white paint was the early 2000s spec home design, right? You had to pay extra money to get two tone or three tone paint. And now that's part of that's, those are high end homes, right? That are being all white. Because yeah. the, the thing about the white is and neutral colors is everybody has their own furniture as well, right? Whether it's similar to yours or not, white will blend with most anything, regardless of what your style is. And everybody that, you know, that's going to buy your home, they're bringing their furniture, right? So to come in and look at a wall and like my couch will never go with that wall, um, you know, or it makes your carpet options, your flooring options so much more versatile when you have a neutral paint. Right. Yeah. And that was one of the things that actually stuck out to me. Um, the last parade of homes that I went to were how many of these homes, I mean, multi-million dollar homes, right? Mm -hmm. They were painted white. I yeah. mean, and Just so, white. I mean, definitely light colors, neutral colors. If you do put any kind of color on it, you want to make sure it's a very subtle um, color, make sure it still flows with the rest of the home. Um, but the other thing that I'm going to say about paint is it's also okay while you're living in your home to make it your home, right? So, you know, if your kids want a blue room or your kids want a pink, you know, pink room or whatever the color they might they might want it or if you want, you know, if if you think, you know, if you want a red wall or whatever, like that's one of those things that's very easily you can change after the fact. So, yeah. don't be afraid when you have a home to make it your own. And that's even some of these, these other things, you know, we'll talk about fixtures and different things. Don't be afraid to live in your house. Don't, don't make your decisions always based on, well, what about the resale, right? Because there's some of these things that for very little money and a little bit of time, we can actually take back to essentially model home status. Mm -hmm. um, so don't be afraid also, if you want that red wall in your kitchen, you know, as an accent wall, put it in. 
just know, you know, your real estate agents probably when they when they sit on your couch to get ready to to sell your home is going to ask you to paint it. Yeah, they're going to tell you, guess what? Baby blue and yellow, which is the most two common colors I see, don't sell. So we'll need to repaint it at that time. Um, but yeah, like Russell's right. I mean, live in your home, enjoy it while it's yours. And just know when the time comes, we will need to repaint and, and go back neutral. Because again, you're, you know, in, in any given price point, in any given area, we only have so many buyers looking for homes like yours. So the last thing you want to do is narrow that field up because you have too many quirky things about your home that people aren't going to like. Because some people, at, well, as a whole, most people are, are very visual. So how they see things and perceive them is how they feel about them. And they have a hard time looking past some of these things, right? They just, even though everybody could paint and probably has, right, to think about having to paint that, you know, most of them would be probably more willing to put in landscaping, at least in their mind, or finish a basement than they would be to paint a wall. Jeremy, how does it make you feel when you when I tell you you're going to have to paint something? Oh, I, I despise painting. I tell you, no, <laughs> I hate painting. Yeah. And, and then for once, me, you know, it, it can it. be a little bit therapeutic. I don't, I don't mind getting the roller <laughs> out and painting the walls. So, no. but it is one of those things again, um, for, for very little money, you can add, you know, definitely marketability, but this is one of those things that you would actually more than likely see a positive return. Yeah, and it's not a dollar, dollar, dollar for dollar return, right? You're not going to say, well, I make 30 bucks an hour and this cost me $500 in paint and I'm going to get that much out of it. It's not, but it does, it does equate to your bottom line as far as the highest net for you, because a buyer that loves your home and is happy is more willing to pay more for your home. Right. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. Um, you know, landscaping. So this is one, obviously, you know, as we, we look at in the summer, is going to be something, you know, if we're covered in snow, there's not a lot we can do, but give me some quick tips on, on just landscaping a yard. So it, it, yeah, landscaping is one of those things that I, when I'm working with my clients, depending on the seasonality of it is I call it a B priority. It is a priority, especially if their curb appeal up front does look pretty good, but we want to get the inside of the home taken care of first and foremost. Right. And then when we go outside, really most yards, that, you know, that we work with that have been lived in it for any number of time are landscaped. So really it's just kind of like revitalizing it, right? Um, anything we can do to make it look crisp and, and a color pop. Definitely the outside of the home oftentimes need to be cleaned, you know, a good power washing just to clean them off, look, maintain, clean your rain gutters out, you know, that sort of things. Don't leave toys up on the roof. But really, if you look at the flower beds in this picture, right, um, you know, it looks very overgrown and for some people is very daunting. Like, you know, they, they, they don't want to go out and pull all those weeds. Plus, you can't really tell where the grass begins and the flower beds end. So if you have somebody that wants the flower beds and they love that, then they think, well, I've got to go through and redo all this when the reality is they only got to pull some weeds um, and then not only that it's just when it's more crisp and clean it just looks better so instead of having open patches of dirt in your flower beds go down to the store it's relatively cheap get some bags of colored mulch and and add some color contrast to that and then especially springtime where we're at now right now Oh, go down to Walmart. They're very, very cheap. Go buy a bunch of flowers. Most of them will probably be dead before you get the home sold because of the, you know, the, the season part of it. But once we go on the market, that always makes the curb appeal of the home look so much better. Put some color in there, put some contrast in there, make sure the, the lawn is mowed, you know, pull the weeds, do the edging. And, and most of my clients just have to, they don't spend near as much time outside as they do inside because it, it doesn't take the amount of work oftentimes you know, just to spruce up a yard. Well, and, and this is one of those that, that definitely, um, again, going back to, if you're going to live there a long time and there's something that you want to do to your yard and, you know, you've saved up and, and that's something you really want, go ahead and do it. Right. I mean, so if you want to put in a, a, you know, a backyard, uh, fire pit area that, that's, you know, all rock landscaped. I mean, don't just dig a hole in the middle of the yard and make a fire pit. But I mean, if you want to do some of that stuff, like that's definitely make sure it it's your home, do it right. But it, in the end, you're not going to see a return on those things. You know, ultimately let's say there weren't even any flower beds here. Right. I wouldn't go in and say, Hey, you've got to cut in some flower beds and add some flowers. No, I'm going to say, go get a pot and, you know, let's, let's make this bouquet of flowers in this pot on your step and just give your, you know, give the front of your house a pop of color. 
Um, but again, I think the bigger thing is just making making sure it's clean. It, it's, you know, like you said, it's edged. Groomed. Yeah. Just so essentially, you know, with this, we don't want it to deter from the house. But in the end, it, you know, as long as it's clean and cut, it's not going to affect your value. And really, as far as adding value, there's only so much you can do before you start seeing a diminishing rate of return on, on those items. And just like in the house, you run a risk that, you know, if you put in this lavish garden, um, you know, the next person's going to see it and be like, wow, that, that's going to take a lot to maintain. That's um, very overwhelming, right? And that's, you don't want to do that. So, um, you know, just making it well taken care of and manicured to the best you can, uh, but don't overwhelm somebody because the likelihood of you finding the exact person that likes to garden and maintain yards like you do um, is probably not very high, right? You're, you're really narrowing your buyer field by doing that. Um, and again, landscaping is very expensive. So it's not like repainting a wall where you can do it relatively cheap and it's a lot of hard work. So um, I, I would definitely go, you know, in a concept of less is more. If you have it, great, clean it up. Don't get crazy. Don't add a bunch of stuff. Um, we're not going to build somebody's dream pergola. You know, um, if you want it there and it makes sense for you, go ahead and put it in. Just know that it, it may not get you a dollar for dollar return out of it, but you're going to enjoy it. And it may, if you keep it simple and neutral enough, the next buyer may enjoy it. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead. So the next one I have on have up here is update fixtures what does that mean <laughs> so i have i have some of my clients that are in date at home sometimes that still have gold doorknobs and things like that and i hear that a lot is like well gold's coming back well the funny part is is not the gold that they have is coming back the toilet gold that you're looking at now is actually what's a little bit trendy um, but I don't see it staying long because there's a very few amount of people that love it. Um, this toilet was uh, a client of ours that, um, you know, just wanted this all his life, wanted to have it. Like Russell said, if it's your home and you're going to live in it, enjoy it for a while. Right. But with this client, I did tell him, look, great. Let's find the toilet. I don't know how he found it in the first place. I mean, <laughs> I I've never seen anything like it. But secondly, um, I just told him, be prepared to change this out. Um, when you're ready to go. And he said, absolutely, I'm just going to enjoy it. Well, I have it here, you know, because this is a throne now and it, and it is a throne. So um, you should see the swan faucets that he have. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful, but they're for him, not for everybody. And he knows that, yeah. um, you know, but, but like doorknobs, hinges, light fixtures, you know, that are, you know, that are gold and dated or, um, you know, uh, you know, we want to update those again. That's where I would recommend visit the model homes, see what's being put in, um, because like the white paint, we are starting to see a little bit of chrome come back instead of the brushed nickel. Um, about uh, eight, nine, ten years ago, it was all bronze, right? Everything was bronze. So it's very trendy. So I would definitely make sure that when you're going to do it, that you are updating it to the trends. But usually those are things that you can do that are very affordable. Um, you can find most of this stuff in multiple places, Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, you know, and buy doorknobs and hinges and you know shower valve covers and things like that light fixtures and and the, they're relatively inexpensive easy to do you could do most of them in an afternoon or two um and it gives again that updated feeling to your house yeah especially well, with goes, a fresh coat of paint new fixtures really stand out and look clean right and i'm just going to go backwards here a little bit in in our presentation back to this kitchen right so um the this is one that in talking about paint and fixtures a little bit. So those cabinets are not new cabinets. I mean, those are painted cabinets, right? So right. we just painted those. And then as far as some of the fixtures, right? So before we had, again, looking back, we had the, the older gold knobs and it was just updated with some brushed nickel, still mm -hmm. round knobs. And then we, we put some, you know, brushed nickel pools on it. So here you have, again, we did update the countertop on this but essentially you have the exact same kitchen here as far as, you know, cabinets with just paint and some updated fixtures. Like all of a sudden we went from, you know, again, the, the old style sink that everyone had growing up to just a, a nice, you know, pull down sink. Um, so again, just those little fixtures, you know, again, going to the lights, moving away from, you know, your, your rounded globe lights a little bit, you know, flatter, modern. And again, these are things that don't cost really that much money, but again, can push you over the top with, you know, an emotional buyer that all of a sudden it's like, oh, I really have to have this stuff. 
Mm -hmm. And so now they're competing. The other thing, you know, appraisers aren't going to give you dollar for dollar what you put in. But when they look at this and you've done a couple of these upgrades, now all of a sudden they start comparing your home with other homes that have been upgraded versus comparing your home, you know, with, with someone that hasn't done any work on it. So again, it's not a dollar for dollar exchange. I can't put 1500 in and know I'm getting 1500 out, but in the end, it does make a difference because now you are going to be compared against homes. So your appraisal and your value and things like that are more likely to come where you want them to be because you know, you, you've been compared against homes that, that are updated and nice. Right. And, well, and really you've done that. So that kitchen, you know, you're probably $500 worth of paint, you know, a good day's worth of work, two or three coats that knobs, you probably what, maybe a hundred bucks on Amazon to read, to order those new knobs countertops. You're a little bit more, but you can shop around, you know, get countertops from, you know, a multitude of, of retail stores and have the sinks and updates and that faucet, you know, hundred, 150 bucks, you know, to put that on and, you know, for, you know, give or take, you know, 1500 bucks, a couple thousand bucks, you've got a brand new kitchen. I mean, it looks completely different and then wait for the next, you know, um, you know, holiday sale at Lowe's or Home Depot or RC Willie to go buy your appliances. Yep. Well, and then the other thing I was going to say, you know, as far as on the bathrooms, right. Some of the fixtures. So it, it's amazing what a new toilet seat and a new, new handle on the toilet will, <laughs> will do for a toilet. I mean, you can replace a, a whole toilet for a hundred bucks, you know, not 89 bucks at Lowell's I think is, is what, you know, we're paying for our toilets. Um, but at the same time, like sometimes, uh, you know, I go to my parents' house and I, I kind of laugh a little bit is they, they still have the wooden, you know, toilets and, mm. you know, that's what they like. My dad loves the old wood look and that, that, that works for him. Um, but you can completely update something by just replacing, again, talking about the toilet by replacing the lid and putting a new handle and all of a sudden it feels like it's a brand new toilet. Yeah, but, but on... The toilets are not like kitchen cabinets, Russell. If you have a wood lid, don't paint it. Replace it. Okay? <laughs> don't paint it. It will not. It will not work. I promise. I, I will make sure to do that. And then again, <laughs> you know, putting in, you know, a, a new bathroom vanity light, things like that, all of a sudden can make your home feel very, very modern. Um, and, and again, make a buyer that that falls in love with it. And again, if you're thinking about doing these things do it while you're living there. Don't, don't say, well, we're going to do that when we move out, like enjoy some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next one we talk about is floors. Um, so when, when is it time to replace a floor? Um, most of the time it's too late. Most people needed to replace their floors a long time ago, to be honest with you. Um, you know, like the trends today, uh, and I hear it and we, we have our builder we work with as well. And we're hearing the feedback a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people are getting to that point where the only carpet in the house should be in like closets and bedrooms. Um, and that's one thing I will say. Um, most buyers do not want hardwood or tile floors in bedrooms. We want carpet, um, especially on cement floors, because then they tend to get cold. Um, but really, if you're going to do a kitchen overhaul and you need it, that's a good time to put flooring in like in this kitchen. Um you know, and, and carpet is one of those things that if, if it's working for you and it's live and you're going to live there for a, a little bit more time, it is a wear and tear item, right? You can replace it, but it is also a little bit challenging to replace it because you have to move all your furniture around and that sort of thing. So my recommendation is, is we replace it right before we're going to sell it, right? Okay. Um, unless it's something that is really just needs to be taken care of or it's gross or old or has holes in it, that sort of thing. Um, because it does show the traffic. It shows wear and tear things and dents. And, and most of the time you can't just repaint, repaint it or replace it like you can a ding and dent in a wall. So I like to have my clients do that at the very, very end, right. especially after they've decluttered their home as well. So it's less to move to put the flooring in and then, and then put their furniture back. Right. And that's one of the things that if you're looking at maybe even possibly, you know, making, turning your home into a rental. So maybe you're, you're not selling it. Right. So flooring is one of those items that, that is going to be replaced. And so if you're, if you're doing it as a rental, I mean, pick something that looks nice, but definitely don't go on the high end on that because more than likely you're going to be replacing it, especially if you allow pets, things like that, you're going to probably have to replace that. You know, well, and that's, they'll try and sell you this high traffic, real high density, you know, commercial type industrial grade carpet with Scotchgard on it that will withstand, you know, um, freeway traffic. 
It won't. I promise you. Your tenants are going to destroy it. So, and I'm not saying go on the cheap end of things, but definitely get the best bang for your buck out of the carpet that makes the home look good and it's new and it's fresh. And to be honest with you, um, on a rental side, not so important, but if you're going to resell your home and your carpet's good, you don't need to spend a lot of money on the carpet itself. Sometimes putting just a little bit more money into the pad makes the carpet feel like it's much better carpet than what it actually is. When people walk in and they feel the bounce and the squish in the floor, they automatically think this is a high-end carpet carpet, which really is not the case. And pad is cheaper to upgrade than carpet. Carpet can be very expensive. So, but as far as a rental goes, I mean, I, I'm just going to go with things that are, that are, you know, budget friendly and that I know I can get pretty regularly, um, you know, because carpet goes in and out of style. It goes in, whether they, they, they'll discontinue a product, you know, quite regularly um, and availability. So especially if you can get it pretty regular and you only have to replace one room, right? You don't want to recarpet the whole house in a rental for just one room that was destroyed, right? Um, so that's why the simpler, the better on that aspect, because you are going to have to replace it. I mean, that's just just how that goes. So I, then, I don't put a lot of effort into that. And then just real quick, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but help me understand the difference between, uh, you know, now we're seeing, you know, your luxury vinyls, you're seeing laminates and hardwood. In the end, a lot of them look the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do I decide whether I should be going with it with a, you know, the luxury vinyl, the laminate or, or spending the money on a hardwood? That, it, it, that's going to be a little different. Um, if you're in Sugar House, if you're in the avenues, some of the Olympus Cove areas, things like that, um, without a doubt, hardwood is the way to go, right? Because those those things are kind of important, you know, to that area. So if you had natural, you know, original hardwoods in a place like Sugar House, um, yeah, we're going to hire a professional first and foremost to refinish those floors and, and bring them back to life. Um, but there's plenty of places, you know, across town, West Valley, Kearns, Ogden, places like that, that are old enough to have original hardwood. Most of the time, you know, we're going to put carpet back over the top of those because that's not really a niche thing there. Um, and it, it, again, you want to don't go on the cheap end with laminate and luxury vinyl, um, especially if you're going to resell it because the products, they don't last. They buckle, they move, you know, they slide around. You can feel it. They're, they're flexible under your feet. You don't have to go with a real high end. Mid grade is usually what I like to do. Um, you know, the little bit thicker, heavier product. It'll last longer. It's more dent and water resistant. Um, some of the luxury vinyls are completely water resistant. But I don't think you need to go and put real expensive hardwood or, or flooring in your home um, for a buyer, you know, if you're going to sell it, right. um, you know, it's all the bargain. You do, need, you do need to be careful with luxury vinyls, right? So that's what they call them or luxury vinyls. Mm -hmm. um, there are still some that definitely are not luxury that are really, you know, they're right there with linoleum. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you don't get it down right. And, you know, you drag your foot and you're going to peel up a corner of it. And so- right. It, it is some of that that even though it appears like it's more affordable, you know, you see some of these that are 89 cents a foot, you know, at Home Depot, Lowe's and things like that. Know that in the end, it may cost you more because you're going to end up replacing that a lot sooner than if you just went up a little bit more, you know, into, uh, you know, a little bit more expensive. Also, you know, a lot of your luxury vinyls, like you said, will be completely waterproof know that most of your laminates, you know, there are some high, high end ones that they'll say are actually waterproof. The rest of them are water resistant, which means, you know, you can spill something on them and wipe them up. But if you let it set it, it you know, if it floods, things like that, they can still be subject to, to damage as well. Warping and buckling. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So okay. I, I like mid grade. Right. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, the next one, again, as we continue to go go into some of these things, some of these now, uh, the next one we're going to talk about are doors, baseboards, you know, casing, things like that. Now we're starting into towards the actually, you know, spending a good amount of money, you know, probably needing a professional to come install these. Other than, you know, sometimes your doors um, just need a, a quick upgrade. So I'm actually going to skip to to this one, right? So if you have hollow panel, you know, doors that were put in in the 40s and 50s, it, it's it's probably time for an upgrade. Um, these are things, though, that, it you know, as we look at, at doors anyways, 
yeah so when we put in doors now we are doing the craftsman style doors you know a little bit more modern but if you have just the standard hollow core six panel white door if it'll clean up there's no you're not going to get any return to go ahead and yank that out and mm -hmm. i mean talk to me a little bit more about when it's time to actually replace baseboards or doors if if you're really investing a great deal of time and money to really upgrade it then it's time for baseboards and doors um, or if you simply can't find a replacement um, for the door itself. Sometimes you can relocate a door from a closet someplace else to replace a damaged door um, and then put something similar in a closet that people don't notice as much. Um, but really, I, I agree. If you can clean up and salvage the door, the six panels, a lot of those are still available. But depending on how old it is, if you can't get replacements, um, and sometimes it's more expensive to do custom cut doors and things like that. It may be time, but really doors and base and casing is if you're, you're really looking to get your home value up. If you're looking to really put it on the market and you've done enough of the other upgrades and things like that, um, that now, now it's, you, you have to do it. Right. So if I upgrade my, you know, my flooring and my walls and my paint and all these other areas and now my doors just make my home look half done, it's probably time to updo them or to upgrade them because um, it will make them more fresh and clean. Um, some of the baseboards, depending on how old it is, you can't find replacement parts for them anymore. So you want to kind of flow. Um, you don't want it to change from room to room because you only upgraded one room. You want to be consistent throughout the house. Um, it's a bit of an investment. And again, it's one of those things like Russell said unless you're that guy that really can do these, this is stuff that probably ought to be left to a professional because if you don't do it right, it shows. Yeah. Nothing's worse than every blemish having, will show. You don't want to have gaps in your seams, you know, along your baseboards or, you know, on your 45s, on your doorways thing. And when I say 45s, you know, the, the angles that come, come together at the tops, you just, you have, if you start having gaps or you're filling those full of, you know, a bunch of, caulking and things like that to try to hide your mistakes it just it's gonna again come back to okay what else is wrong with this house if this wasn't put together correct and then again like jeremy said if you're not investing in the flooring and the floors you're probably not going to get you know much of a return if any at all in putting in new doors if you haven't upgraded the other things so this is definitely you know again getting into some of those higher levels and, you know, the next thing we're going to talk about are the bathrooms and kitchens. And, you know, if you were deciding, should I put, you know, money into this or should I upgrade maybe my kitchen or bathroom, you're probably going to choose the kitchen and bathroom before you do the doors, you know, and basin casing. But your bathrooms and kitchens are more expensive than, you know, putting in uh, yeah. new, new doors. Well, and, and oftentimes, if you're going to be redoing laminate floors and tiles and things like that, um, the baseboards have to come off. Right. Um, if, if you're just going to cut the baseboard short or I mean the flooring short of the baseboards and then put a trim like a corner bead around there, they never hold up. They always it, it, they, they look awful and they look half done. So the right way to do it, an installer will tell you that they want to pull the baseboards off. Now, if your baseboards are in good shape and they just need to be re reattached and repainted to put the flooring in, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, but sometimes the time spent if they break or they're dated or they're beat up enough, it's time to just go ahead and put new baseboards up. Um, even if you don't change the actual style and you stick with something traditional like this home would be, you know, um, or not this one, but a lot of them, the colonial is one that seems to be timeless, um, you know, baseboards. Um, so you could, and you can find a couple of variations of that, that if you're going to tear it up to do the flooring, it, oftentimes it's easier just to put new baseboards down. Yep. Well, and then, you know, on the, these doors actually just kind of a, a quick throw out on that. These are actually the same doors. And they just bought some molding and put on there and painted them. So there mm -hmm. is some things as well. Again, if you weren't going to update the floors and everything else, that again, paint can go a long ways and you can add a little bit of accent and, and, and update them as well. Well, so again, gonna care, it, if you're going to do the door molding like you did in that picture, though, believe me, unless somebody's walking around with only one shoe on and you don't make your squares and your molding trims straight and square <laughs> and plumb, they will see it. Right. Right. Okay, so the last three, you know, we, we've got about 15 minutes here we're going to wrap up with, but the last three are some major projects, things that, you know, definitely can add value, but again, may not actually give you a full return if you haven't updated the rest of the home. 
but there are certain times when it's time to update a bathroom, you know, so we've walked into some that, you know, have a pink tub and pink countertops and tile countertops and different things. Um, so this is one that we did, right? So there, there does come a point where it's like, okay, it is time to upgrade that bathroom. Now I do have, and we'll talk about the next one. So the difference between these two. So the very first one that we're looking at here, this was actually a full gut job of the bathroom, right? So this was a, actually a very extensive remodel on this bathroom mm -hmm. um, to be able to get it modern, to make sure everything, you know, we replaced all of the plumbing. That's one thing in these old homes, you start messing with, you know, plumbing, you may end up replacing all of it, you know. Well, just, the, yeah, the one thing that, that, that we want to stress on that bathrooms and kitchens, that's opening Pandora's box, once you start, you can't stop. And like next to tubs, it's notorious. I was in a client's house just the other day. They started the bathroom upstairs. Oh, we're just going to put flooring in it, right? We're just going to update it that. Well, as soon as they got down to it, every, especially if a home's ever had kids in it, next to that tub, it's a very, very good chance that there's some rotting in the subfloor along that line. So understand that when you're ready to take on that bathroom, make sure that you're ready for anything that comes at you, plumbing, electrical, the water damage, all of that, because it is Pandora's box. Yep. So again, this is one that was, it was very expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. we took this all the way down to the stubs. All the plumbing had to come out um, and, you know, new plumbing put in. But again, if I walk in and, and essentially this is the bathroom I have, you know, it, it is time because that is something that it, if as a buyer walks in, if, if this is what they see in the bathroom, right, automatically they're either one, not even going to make an offer on the home or two, they're going to say, I've got to redo this bathroom. And so they're going to adjust their offer accordingly. Now, the second bathroom here that, that we're showing, again, looks very modern and updated. But the reality is with this bathroom, so this is the same tub. We just had it reglazed. So they just came in and they, they you know, freshened it up. Again, this is the exact same uh, vanity here. This one's just been painted. So really we're, you know, and then we did do, we, we put in tile around the bathtub um, for, for the surround. But honestly, this was something we probably actually could have left and been okay with this bathroom. But again, we, you know, we're remodeling it. So we, we didn't want it to appear like we had something left undone. So we did do the full, full, you know, tub surround here. Um, but this, this bathroom, it, it, it amazes me, you know, when we're looking at this bathroom, full gut job, repiping, things like that. I mean, you know, we're going over $10,000 to, you know, do this job versus this job that still, again, looks like a very modern update and almost, you know, someone may say, yeah, they, they got it and, and redid this bathroom when really we're a hundred dollars into the toilet, you know, a hundred dollars into, you know, paying someone to paint that, that cabinet or 20 bucks into pools, you know, some new fixtures, and then, you know, a couple hundred bucks for the, the sink top and counter here. So really, depending on what your bathroom looks like, you can actually make it look completely, I mean, you can make it it's a makeover. Brand new, mm -hmm. you know, for anywhere from 500 bucks to a couple thousand dollars, just depending on the age of your home and, and what you have to do. But again, if you're, if you're in a home that's, you know, 1950s or earlier just know if you start messing with some of that you could end up doing a full gut job and tearing out some pipe well speaking of pandora's box this is before you start into this to do some research and make sure you know your material russell learned a pretty good lesson on this bathroom this mirror that you see in the original one had a small chip in it was very nice and and he wasn't okay with it so he destroyed the mirror which was glued to the wall like it was meant to be two buildings stuck together this thing did not come off easy and eventually ended up being refinishing retexturing repainting the wall but russell tell him how hard that mirror was to find because that was custom cut to that vanity yeah we we spent a good amount of time looking for a, a, a mirror that was actually the same size and again, you know, this had a very, very small scratch in it and all together, you know, to remove that mirror, we were probably five to six hours into getting that mirror off and cleaning it up. And then again, 
trying to find a mirror that actually fit that vanity was was not fun. So they're very expensive when you have to have glass cut and installed. It gets very, very expensive. So it, I guess the, the moral of the story there, mm -hmm. if there's a little bit of a nick in a mirror, um, sometimes maybe that's OK to leave it, especially if you test it and it's glued to the wall. Um, <laughs> you're going to you're definitely not going to get the return on your time or investment to replace this mirror with the mirror on the right. Right. Okay, so let's talk about kitchens. Um, so hmm. again, kitchens are one of those things that, <laughs> that definitely, you know, you hear it that the kitchen sells the home, that the highest return can be in a kitchen. Um, but the other thing on kitchens that you have to understand is you can also um, overdo it. I mean, you right. can spend, you know, 10 to $12,000 remodeling a kitchen. Or I've even heard of people spending, you know, sixty to eighty thousand dollars remodeling their kitchen. And so, again, if it's something that you're doing custom for yourself and you have the 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 budget to do it, do whatever you you know. Make sure you're 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 doing what you want. But if you're you're doing it to resell, there does come a point where you can do too much to a kitchen. Um, but again, so this this is one that was, you know, very dated and, and we did feel like it was um, something that needed to be updated. So, I mean, talk about this kitchen a little bit about what you would do if you saw this kitchen. Well, well, first, if I saw this kitchen, um, I would put the brakes on immediately. Right. Because. Um, like you said, you can over rehab a kitchen and they can get very, very expensive, right? So the first thing I'm going to do before I pull up Pinterest and get all kinds of creative and all these glamorous ideas, I'm going to call my favorite real estate agent and say, okay, go and pull all the homes that have been remodeled, you know, within a couple miles of my house or by my zip code, for example, and show me all the kitchens that have been done, right? So that I know I'm not going to over rehab my kitchen because you can, and kitchens are very expensive. Um, but on this particular kitchen, it's a very wide open space. Um, it's not very flowing. You know, the, uh, the, the cooktop is kind of stuck in the corner. This thing was big enough to make this. This is like a chef's dream kitchen, right? So knowing your kitchen, so you can see the finished product there. Um, you know, we actually took out a door, shrank it down, added some cabinetry because the kitchen, a lot of um, people, what I hear, uh, you know, that their biggest complaint about them is not enough space, not enough cupboards. So you saw in the old picture where they, uh, in the 70s, they were notorious for framing down the ceiling and putting in the boxes. Um, we take those out as often as possible. Take it out, put taller cabinets right to the ceiling. Not only does it look better, it makes the room feel more open and bright, but you literally have another foot plus of cabinet space. Um, if there's no pantry, we added this pantry cabinet next to the fridge over here so that, you know, because it didn't make sense in, to frame in a pantry and kind of get creative and put space in there. So we added that down. We shrank down. This was a double sliding glass door that was next to that, framed it all down, moved it over, put in the pantry. We created more space between the oven and the fridge because it was too boxed in. Um, you know, like, especially if you're going to splash or spill stuff, you know, it's going to end up all over the place. So we created some space there, um, put in the backsplash put in the pendant lights, you know, and the can lights. But the biggest thing about this kitchen was the island. This, it had the space to put in a very nice island. Um, and, and overall, an island is not too expensive, as long, especially if you don't get too wild in, in you know, in them, because you can spend a lot of money on cabinets. Um, but it created so much more counter space. Um, and islands and a kitchen like this, because this was a great room concept, not only is it just more cabinet space, more counter space, it's better for entertaining purposes. You know, this, this, you know, when you have a, a nice table in there and you have, you know, guests and things like that over, you can cook and prep and, and do all that stuff while entertaining across the, the, the island. You know, we, we always do the overhang on there so that you can put bar stools under this. Um, often people are eating from the island as well. You can cook and prep and eat in the same spot. Um, but anything we can do to make it feel bigger, more open and add usable space is, is always what we're looking to do. Um, right. We don't get too wild. This one we talked about putting in a double oven that can get very, very expensive. But again, you want to make sure that you're not over or under rehabbing your kitchen to your area. Yeah. And that's the main thing, right? Is, is making sure that you are, again, if you're doing it for yourself, go as custom and as nice as you want. If you're doing it to add value to the home, um, for resale, make sure you're consulting with people. Again, some of the things, uh, making sure you're hiring professionals um, to come in and, and do the work. 
And, and so again, just a couple other things, the kitchen on the right. So again, this is one that actually, um, we, the, the cabinets were solid. I mean, those were solid oak cabinets. And so they it were was custom built. Mm -hmm. it, it was just a matter of adding some hardware. We did uh, two tone paint these, um, put in, you know, new countertops and all of a sudden it was like, you know, again, a brand new kitchen. Um, I know we're, we're starting to run short on time, so we will go still go through these, you know, if you want to hang out, we will go ahead and finish this up. We'll go through these fairly quickly. Cause again, now we're starting to get into some big in investments as far as, you know, money that you're going to put into a home. So one of the things, you know, as far as the next one we are going to talk about is finishing a basement. This does add, you know, finished square footage to a home. So this is actually one that does add value. It just, again, um, it, finishing a basement can be expensive, right? I mean, you're, you're taking it, especially if you go in and all you have is, is the cement walls. So talk to me about what, what I can expect to see on a return from a basement. Um, uh, basements is one of those things, especially its price point, right? So when we're in a higher price point, you know, most people that are buying up there, they do want kind of a turnkey thing. And if they don't like exactly what this, they see, oftentimes they're not afraid to do a little remodel. But if you're in anything that would be ma mainly considered as a first time move up or a first time buyer category, to be honest with you, the way I see it, and, and I hear this from people a lot, landscaping and basements, they're 50-50, you know, as far as whether I should or shouldn't refinish or uh, finish the basement. They're very expensive. They're very time consuming, getting permits, working through cities to do it the right way, because you have to disclose all of that to your buyers as well. By law, you're supposed to permit all of these things and it can take time. And then you have multiple contractors because not all one contractor does all the work, right? Electricians and flooring guys and um, plumbers and HVAC and drywall and paint and finished carpentry and all these things. Um, but people dream, you know, with their basement, they walk down and I can't tell you how often I hear it is, Oh, I want an unfinished basement. I got this plan and I got that plan and everything else. So again, that's going to be depending on where you want to be price wise, as far as a resale value, or if you're the only unfinished basement out of all the homes listed on the MLS and I want to get this price, then maybe we should talk about, um, you know, finishing the basement because I've, I, I don't, my personal opinion is, is I don't feel that it hurts the sale of the home unless you're getting into a certain area, a certain neighborhood, a certain price point, because these buyers, they see sweat equity, right? And then again, they want to make it their own, right? And that's the right. same thing with specialty like landscaping, you know, pergolas and fire pits and all these crazy ideas because they dream in those things. Like the house is kind of the house, as long as it's new and updated, most people don't get extravagant with their main living areas of their home, but their basements, I have seen all, well, I mean, even this one, the wet bar setup, the entertaining room, the theater room, the pool room, toy room, craft room. I mean, I've heard so many different ideas that as soon as you, do what you want to the basement. Now they don't get to do what they want to the basement right? because it is a dreamscape type kind of a place. So I would be careful with finishing basements um, on average, you know, most uh, appraisers, I think right now we might be at about 15 bucks a square foot, as far as value add to your basement. Um, right. you, you will not get a dollar for dollar return. I know basement finishing, you're probably in the range of about 30 bucks a square foot to have it done, give or take. And that's if you don't do anything crazy like wet bars and things like that. You know, an average bathroom is probably going to cost you in a basement to be done, you know, between eight and $10,000. Um, so you are not going to get a one-to-one -one return on that one. Um, it, it, it's a pretty big investment. If you're already halfway through a basement or a project, um, I definitely, you know, and you've got drywall up and things that's been done right. We probably want to finish up what you've started. But as far as taking on new projects, um, oftentimes I don't, I don't feel it's the best approach and I don't really think it's a good return on your investment. And, and again, that's one of those things, right? That you're going to look at the comparable cells and say like, okay, like, yeah, if you finish this basement, it's going to give you, this is what we could sell it for. And, you know, you can make that determination, get the bids, get the price to say, okay, is it really worth me putting $50,000 into this? If it's only getting increased my value, 30,000. Right. But you may look, okay, like if I go ahead and finish this square footage again, so talking about maybe, you know, some of the old, older areas where maybe your home currently sits, it, it's a two bedroom, one bath, but we can go ahead and fit in the basement to make us a three bedroom, two bath. Now, all of a sudden that home becomes a lot more desirable to a lot more buyers. So again, that's one that you're probably, you know, you're going to want to talk to your agent if you're doing this to sell your home. 
again, if you're going to live in it, live in your home, make it yours. But if you're doing it to increase the value to sell it, make sure you go in educated because um, otherwise you may spend a lot of money and realize it didn't increase your value hardly at all. Well, not only that, a lot of people try to do their own basements, which is fine. I commend that. Right. But, but buyers, they're, they're smarter than ever. Right. They know when it's been professionally done and when it hasn't, and they will nitpick them apart. Yep. Okay. Last thing, you know, that we talk about it is a full remodel, right? So this is one of those things, just like basements. I mean, you're probably looking at, you know, especially if you're taking out walls or doing anything, you know, you're going to need to get an engineer in there, make sure your whole home's not going to fall down. You know, you're going to need to permit the home. There's a lot of things that you're going to have to do. Um, but sometimes it, it's just, if you have the funds to do it, you, you know, if you're going to take down a whole project, this is now where it comes together that everything that we're talked about, you know, again, just putting in paint, maybe you're not going to see a, a huge return. Just putting in baseboards, you won't see a huge return. Just seeing in putting in flooring, maybe you're not going to see a dollar for dollar return. But if you go in and do all of that to a home, you can increase the value of the home. Um, but again, what is your time? What are your resources? What are you able to do? How much is that labor going to cost you? Um, but again, these are these are things that you can go in and, and take a home that's extremely dated and, and, and make it modern and get a return on your money. And so this is one, again, that just as an example of, of some of the stuff that you can do to a home again. Um, so this is one, we had a wall here. Um, you know, the kitchen was dated. We actually changed the layout of the kitchen. We opened up the wall a little bit. So, you know, this is, um, kind of the after, like I said, we opened up the wall, we reconfigured where the kitchen sink was before it was underneath that window, we relocated it because this was just some dead space that wasn't big enough for an actual table. Mm -hmm. So we went ahead and made the kitchen bigger. We opened up the cabinets, we re relocated where the fridge was, opened up the, the wall. Um, again, added the pantry. Added the Resize the window at the end so that you could add more cabinetry down there beyond the oven, um, put a beam in across there. And really, because this one was very closed off, the oven was behind the wall and it, the kitchen did not flow well into the dining area. So it was just kind of like this dirty, dark dungeon box. So we took it all out because flow is one of those things that make a buyer happier and more emotional about a home. If it flows and it's open and I don't feel claustrophobic and, and locked in, then it really makes... The, you know, the, the, the difference. So anytime you're going to go into a free, a full remodel like this, be careful because again, it's Pandora's box, but you always want to do what you can to open a home up in today's, you know, what people want and make it flow better. Right. Remember when these homes were built, they were built with a different purpose in mind. They were very um, practical about it. Right. As far as and technology and, you know, materials were nowhere near as advanced as they are today, as far as, you know, space saving and functionality and things like that. So um, opening them up, making them flow, putting new stuff in them. This kitchen was was a hundred times better than what it was before. Now it flows into the area with the dining room and the living room. Um, and it just really and the whole area brightened up, too. You didn't even need the lights on. There was enough window space now that it had so much natural light that it just it, it was just very well. Welcoming. Yep. And then it, that door also led into the laundry room. So you couldn't entertain or enjoy your front room and things like that without listening to the washer and dryer. Um, so we closed off that door that was right, right through there where the water heater is, closed that off, put a door. So now that become a mud room again. So utilizing the space, making better purpose of the space. You know, um, so it has a mudroom, a laundry room that's all main level with the with the you know the water heater there, and close that off to where it, it's its own compartmentalized you know area. Yep. Okay. Well, sounds good. That is the last the last item that we were going to talk about. So again, if you have any questions, I mean, uh, definitely put them in the chat before we leave, or reach out to you know you can reach out to myself, to Jeremy, or the real estate agent on our team that invited you uh, tonight. We appreciate you taking some of your time out of your evening this see, you know, to be with us, to learn a couple of these things. And again, a lot of these things don't have to be overwhelming. You can actually do a lot to add value to your home without spending a lot of money. 
And again, if you're going to take on a big project, definitely if the end goal is to increase the value of your home, make sure that you're talking with, with a real estate, with your real estate agent so that they can kind of give you some ideas as far as what's actually going to give you a return. Because depending on where you live, depending on your location, um, the return is going to be different. So you could spend the same amount of money on, you know, a kitchen or a bathroom. And depending on the area, if your average sales price is 300,000, uh, you know, you can go in and probably put in a basic kitchen. If your average sales price is 650 to $800,000, you know, if you don't put in the right kitchen, you could actually hurt the value of your home. And so you want to make sure that when you are looking to do things, you know, to increase the value of your home, give us a call and make sure, you know, we're more than happy to help you, you know, walk through those projects and also refer you to professionals that can help you with those repairs. Yeah. Yeah. Just remember that it is, you can do either, you can under rehab it or you can over rehab it and knowing your market and what's around you is, is what will help you make those decisions. And again, sometimes those will answer the question, do I need to remodel? Do I need to do certain updates? I have clients ask me that all the time and independent on the market conditions you're in, sometimes you don't need to do as much to get you know the the, the value out of your home right and, and that's the reality that's the market we're facing right now right <laughs> is is honestly um depending on where your your home is and pretty much everywhere in the state of utah um we're not going to have you do a lot of a lot of the upgrades to the the home we're going to make sure it's presentable we're going to make sure you know we we position it to where we can get the most amount of your money um, but the reality is with the low, low inventory that we're facing right now, um, you're not having to go do all the remodels to, to essentially push the, push the value of your home. And so if you're thinking about selling again right now, there is a low inventory in the state of Utah. Um, we're getting top dollars uh, for everyone's homes, again, without having to spend as much money as maybe you would definitely in a buyer's market. So again, Want to thank everyone for spending a little bit t bit of time with us this evening. And uh, again, once again, if you do have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us. And um, you know, go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good evening.